Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for uh, the last of our uh, 2024 spring uh, seminar series uh, presentations hosted by the Stavros Niakos Foundation Center for Hellenic Studies at Simon Fraser University. My name is Dimitris Kralis. I'm the director of the SNF Center for Hellenic Studies. I'm also a Byzantinist, so this is uh, familiar uh, waters. Uh, and I will be responsible for moderating today's talk. Uh, before we uh, begin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this event is taking place at Simon Fraser University on Burnaby Mountain on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Kukatlam peoples. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to uh, uh, present uh, today uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Evan Freeman. Uh, Dr. Freeman is an uh, assistant professor uh, and uh, uh, holder of the Hellenic and Indian Congress of BC, chair uh, in Hellenic Studies at the Department of uh, uh, Global Humanities. Uh, his uh, focus is uh, in the art and ritual of the Byzantine Empire and cross-cultural interactions in the wider uh, medieval world, mobility, monumental uh, church art, and materiality. Uh, he uh, is also interested in uh, questions of reception uh, of Byzantine art in uh, uh, kind of modern contexts which uh, brings him uh, closer to modern Greek uh, realities uh, too. Uh, he has produced uh, videos, essays, academic articles, and an edited volume uh, and other open educational resources for Smart History, Khan Academy, and other digital uh, and public humanities uh, projects. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will uh, pass the uh, podium to uh, Evan. Thank you. Thanks, Dimitris. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here, especially at this point, this late point in the term. Uh, and thanks to those of you tuning in online. It's a real pleasure to be able to share some of my uh, research with you today. Uh, one of my students recently told me that my PowerPoint presentations often have too many images without enough text to explain them. And so this is something I'm working on. Uh, and so I've tried to insert uh, several text slides in my talk today um, to, to act as, as sort of markers and signposts for us along the way. So here is just a sort of brief outline of the three sections of uh, my talk today, uh, starting with the first, Byzantine materiality. A small, a small bloodstone cameo in the collection of the Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and Collection in Washington, D.C., challenges us to consider the role of materials in Byzantine art. The 12th century cameo displays a carved relief image or icon of the Virgin Mary. Greek characters appear on either side, as is typical in Byzantine icons, identifying Mary as the mother of God. She appears in a three-quarter pose, gazing upward and raising both her hands in a gesture of prayer. In response to her prayer, the hand of God descends from heaven in the upper right corner of the image with a gesture of blessing. But despite the presence of both text and image, the cameo's stone substrate does not recede into the background as, for example, with a painted icon like this one on the right. With this panel icon of the Virgin from the Monastery of St. Catherine at Mount Sinai, the wooden support is covered by layers of gesso and paint so that it's no longer visible. The image takes precedence. With the Dunbar Noakes cameo, the bloodstone's red texture re remains visible and even competes with the image for the viewer's attention. Flecks of vivid red streak diagonally across the surface of the cameo in the same direction as the Virgin's gesture. This directional alignment is no accident, it's by design. The artist has carved the image so that the stone's red veins correspond with the direction of the Virgin's gaze and her upraised hands. As a result, these red flecks hover between form and abstraction, both reinforcing the composition while simultaneously undermining the pictorial logic of the image. This cameo exemplifies what the art historian Herbert Kessler has referred to as the overt materiality of medieval art. In his 2011 book, Seeing Medi Medieval Art, Kessler states, overt materiality is a distinguishing characteristic of medieval art. Materials do not vanish from sight through the mimicking of the perception of other things, to the contrary, their very physicality asserts the essential artifice of the image or thing or object. 
In the case of the Dunbar Noakes cameo, as Jacqueline Turk Stonberg has argued, the object's overt materiality points to its probable historical function. From late, from late antiquity, hematite and other red stones were associated with blood and were even believed to cure ex excessive menstruation and blood diseases. Around the turn of the 20th century, anthropologist James George Fraser uh, describes such beliefs that like produces like and that an effect resembles its cause as sympathetic magic, a term that has often been applied to objects like this but also remains much debated. More recently, Turk Stonberg has interpreted such objects as performative in function by means of persuasive, an persuasive analogy, speech acts, and show acts. An earlier object, likely produced in 6th or 7th century Byzantine Egypt, now preserved at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, illustrates this same healing function very well. The amulet pictures a miracle from the Synoptic Gospels in which Jesus heals a woman with an issue of blood. On one side of the amulet, the woman is shown touching Christ's cloak and being healed, while on the opposite side, a woman with, ar a woman with arms raised in an Aram's pose likely depicts the same woman after she's been healed. The accompanying inscription paraphrases the account of the miracle in Mark's gospel, Mark 5, suggesting the efficacy of the amulet for the healing of its wearer. And the woman being in a state of flowing blood came, having suffered and having spent much, she benefited nothing, but rather had known, on the opposite side, the source of her flow of blood was dried up in the name of her faith. Speaking about such amulets, Antia Bosselman Rukbi argues, the assumed power of the object could work in two ways. First, through the intercession of the depicted individuals, Christ, the Virgin Mary, saints. Second, through the material of the gemstone itself as supposedly having magical properties. So the red stones from which these objects were carved were no arbitrary surfaces or passive recipients of the images that adorn them. The material substrates were just as important to the function of the object as their images they bore. These objects were not only images representing holy figures, they were performative objects in the sense that J. L. Austin described speech acts as performative, not only describing a holy figure or event, but also doing something to and for the user. The overt materiality of these objects also suggests an embodied mode of engagement from their users. These were not artworks to be viewed or admired from a respectful distance on a gallery wall or in a museum case. These sort of objects were worn around the neck. They were caressed and they were kissed. The image of the woman being healed by touching Christ's garment served as a proxy for the amulet's owner. It offered a sort of prescription for the object's use, encouraging the user to seek healing through touch, simultaneously appealing to the carved icon of Christ and at the same time to the red stone into which the icon was carved. Objects like these prompt us to consider such categories as form, matter, image, and medium, and how these concepts were understood in the pre-modern world. The modern discipline of art history, which emerged in the Italian Renaissance, and through which Byzantine objects like th these have often been interpreted in books and in museums, long privileged form and image as the chief bearers of an artwork's or object's significance. Through analysis of form and iconography, the history of art has often been told as a series of changing styles reflecting the, the spirit of an age, or as the transmission of conventional imagery that communicates symbolic meanings. Within this framework, matter is often understood as a passive recipient of form. The conventional use of the term medium to refer to artistic materials and techniques reflects this understanding. Originating as a Latin word referring to a middle space, it suggests the route by which an image or meaning is conveyed from one human subject to another, a means to an end. The Byzantines, it seems, sometimes took a similar position. Uh, for example, when the Emperor Alexios the first Komnenos was forced to seize and melt down precious metals uh, from church treasuries, which apparently included icons in order to fund the military. This, of course, prompted accusations of iconoclasm, the destruction of sacred images from Bishop Leo of Chalcedon. But a church council convened in Constantinople in 1095 decided in favor of the emperor, defining the image, defining the icon as the image alone and not the material substrate or the object itself. But 
objects like the amulet and the Dumbarton Oaks cameo uh, trouble these neat categories. The probable function of this object suggests that its image and its material substrate are not so easily separated. To the extent that the icon's diagonal composition was a response to the diagonal orientation of the stone's red flex, and the icon's blocky letters, a product of the sculptor's struggle against the hardness of the stone, the cameo also challenges established assumptions about the primacy of human interventions in the creation of such objects. The cameo suggests that the stone itself exerted a kind of agency alongside human actors in this object's production. For art historian Michael Ann Holly, the term materiality conjures this interplay of agency, interplay and agency of matter, form, and image. Holly says, materiality is more than a medium. A medium is that which carries a visual message, and together, structure and image, they result in the thickness, the sensuous materiality of a work of art, a thing among other things. Yet in its physical vibrancy, its affect and effect, this special thing possesses a certain kind of agency. In recent years, the materiality of art and other objects, as well as the corresponding embodied and multisensory experiences of users, have increasingly occupied scholarship on the late antique and medieval worlds, and most recently have inspired Byzantine Materiality, a volume that I have edited with uh, my colleague Roland Betancourt, who's professor of art history at the University of California, Irvine, and which will be published uh, by De Gruyter later this year. The various chapters in this volume contributed by a group of international scholars on late antique and Byzantine art history examine a range of material things, including icons, architectural spaces, jewelry and other everyday objects, as well as religious objects and substances such as pilgrim tokens, relics, and the bread and wine of the Eucharist. They are united by a shared exploration of the entanglements of materials, forms, and images, the meanings, values, and effects, and agencies that result from these entanglements, and the ways that Byzantine thinkers and users as inheritors of the Greco-Roman tradition conceptualized matter and form. So in what follows, I would like to discuss Middle Byzantine chalices, which is the topic of my chapter in this volume, as a kind of case study for the roles that materials could play in Byzantine rituals like the divine liturgy. So part two, the chalice as metonym. Some 25 Middle Byzantine chalices are preserved in the treasury of the Basilica of San Marco in Venice, Italy, the largest collection of Middle Byzantine chalices preserved anywhere in the world. Most, if not all, of these chalices were likely brought to Venice as booty following the sack of Constantinople in 1204 by the Crusaders of the Fourth Crusade. As you can see, most of these chalices are multimedia objects. They incorporate gold and silver, as well as stonework, glass, porcelain enamels, gems, and pearls. The majority feature bowls carved from colorful stones, such as alabaster, jasper, and sardonyx. Uh, as we can see with this example, which is uh, well known as the Chalice of the Patriarchs and which likely dates from the 10th or 11th century. Yet church inventories, monastic typica, and private wills all indicate that the majority of Byzantine chalices were made primarily from precious metals, from gold and silver, as well as from the less, less precious bronze, so not stone. The prevalence of stone bowls and relative lack of precious metal vessels among the objects in the treasury of San Marco is almost certainly due to the fact that, uh, that metals, unlike stones, can be melted down and converted into money. Metal chalices, which undoubtedly populated the many churches of the Byzantine capital right up until 1204, were uh, almost certainly among the many objects and monuments liquidated by the crusaders to help pay for the Fourth Crusade. But additionally, the prevalence of uh, carved stone bowls among these vessels preserved at San Marco is also a reflection of their high quality as luxury objects commissioned by elite donors in the capital. Inscriptions on several of these chalices indicate that these were objects commissioned by emperors and other wealthy members of the court. Now, we've already seen that Byzantine viewers also associated red stones with blood. So the materiality of these chalices corresponds with their ritual function as containers for the wine of the Eucharist, which was consecrated and consumed as the blood of Christ. And in many cases, this ritual function can be 
uh, really confidently identified through inscriptions that adorn many of the rims of these vessels. This one says, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. This text, which is probably familiar to many of you, uh, originates in the New Testament and accounts of Christ's Last Supper, which he uh, shared with his apostles shortly before the crucifixion. Uh, but these words, uh, which liturgical scholars often refer to as the words of institution, were also repeated by the clergy during the consecration of the Eucharistic bread and wine in the celebration of the Divine Liturgy. So during the celebration of the Divine Liturgy, the materiality of a chalice like this would have visually evoked the Eucharistic wine or blood contained within. Whereas the chalice of the patriarchs uh, is also adorned with enamel icons, pearls, and other ornaments. Um, other vessels, like this sardonyx chalice from the 10th or 11th century, lack figural imagery, allowing the stone's dramatic hues and textures to become even more prominent. And you can see it has a similar inscription around the rim, although a bit abbreviated. In addition to uh, chalices with red stone bowls, a handful of chalices feature transparent glass bowls. This two-handled chalice with prunts, which is uh, what experts on glass call these little knobby things uh, sticking out from the surface, uh, probably from the 11th century, offers an example of this sort of glass chalice. Although these two materials, stone and glass, at first appear quite distinct, I would like to argue that they uh, must have functioned in very similar ways in the context of the divine liturgy. Both sought to make visible the Eucharistic wine or blood contained within. Red stone vessels achieved this through material mimicry. Both the swirling patterns and the red hues look like wine or blood. And glass vessels achieve a similar end through their transparency. They become windows through which the viewer can behold the wine or blood within. So both materials blur the distinction between container and contents, both in some sense dematerialize so that the Eucharistic mystery within can be revealed on the outside. This conflation of the chalice with the Eucharistic wine is not unique to these vessels in San Marco. It dates way back to the time of the New Testament and continues through the Byzantine period uh, in uh, several textual sources. This can be observed with texts that employ parallel constructions pairing bread with cup rather than bread with wine, which can be found, for example, in the account of the Last Supper recorded in Matthew's gospel. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the, new, of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In his letter, first letter to the Corinthians, Paul, Paul employs a similar parallel construction. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? The same parallel constructions pairing bread and cup continue to appear for centuries. For example, a Byzantine commentary on the divine liturgy, uh, traditionally attributed to Yermanos I, patriarch of Constantinople, but more recently attributed to an anonymous author of the late, late seventh or first half of the eighth century, um, states, but now the Christ and God has given his own body and poured out and mixed his own blood, that of the new covenant saying, this is my body and my blood, which is broken and poured out for the remission of sins. So whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you confess my death and resurrection. In these New Testament texts and later Byzantine sources, the chalice is synonymous with the Eucharistic wine, understood as the blood of Christ, which it contained. In literary terms, the practice of employing cup or chalice to refer to the wine should be understood as a metonym. A metonym is a figure of speech or thought in which something refers to something else with which it is closely associated. This is, of course, uh, a very old and well-established concept that goes back to uh, the ancient rhetorical tradition of Greece and Rome, uh, where the term uh, metonymia referred to the change of a name. But metonyms are not exclusively or even primarily rhetorical or linguistic devices. Instead, they are first and foremost a cognitive phenomenon. Research in cognitive linguistics has shown that metonyms are usage-based knowledge networks. They develop over time from our everyday experiences. In other words, metonyms begin with our experience and our thoughts, 
and are only subsequently manifested in language and in other forms of symbolic communication. According to Jeanette Littlemore, the fact that metonymy is a cognitive phenomenon, not just a linguistic one, means that it appears in a range of other modalities besides language. Metonymy has been found to play a role in a wide variety of different modes of communication and meaning creation, such as art, music, film, and advertising, and Byzantine chalices, I think we can add. But why did the Byzantine chalice become a metonym for the Eucharistic wine? Because of the inherently liquid nature of the wine in contrast to the solid state of the bread. Bread can be picked up off the table, be broken into pieces and passed from hand to hand to those gathered around a meal. In contrast, wine and other liquids must remain in their vessels until they are drunk. As we can see with this 14th century uh, painting of the communion of the apostles, you can see Christ handing out the bread on the left side of the image, but holding the chalice of wine on the right side of the image. This was true at the Last Supper described in the New Testament and it was also true in the ritual celebration of the Eucharist in Byzantine churches, at least for a millennium or so. Worshippers received the Eucharistic bread as the body of Christ in their hands, then drank the wine from the chalice as the blood of Christ. The wine was always mediated, both visually and physically, by the chalice that contained it. This practice of receiving the bread and wine separately, liturgical scholars uh, describe this as communion under two species or both kinds, did not, however, last forever. The clergy, the bishops, priests, and deacons, continued to receive communion under two species in this manner. But by the 11th century, most non-clergy, the lay people, were now receiving communion by intinction with a spoon which you can see in the image on the right here. So after the clergy received the bread in their hands and drank the wine from the chalice, they then broke up or cut up pieces of the bread and put them directly into the chalice with the wine and then used a spoon to spoon uh, both together into the mouth of the community. And so you can see uh, St. Zosimus here in the image on the right, holding a chalice in his left hand and a spoon in his right which is breaking the, the frame of the image in a really wonderful way. Since Byzantine chalices from San Marco all date to right around this time, uh, it's possible that they were used to commune people in either fashion or perhaps in their history in both ways. On the one hand, this liturgical, innovative liturgical practice of communing people with a spoon distanced worshipers from the chalice since they no longer drank directly from it. But on the other hand, communion by intinction arguably gave the chalice even greater importance as a mediator uh, of the blood, but also now the body as well, um, since worshipers received both from the same vessel. All right, veiling and unveiling the chalice and the divine liturgy. Roland Betancourt has shown that Byzantine writers described the process of venerating icons and other objects through the paired senses of sight and touch. Writing in the eighth century, the monk and theologian John of Damascus recounts, many times I have seen those who long for someone when they have seen his garment, greet it with their eyes and lips as if they, as if they were the one longed for himself. Betancourt comments on this passage, the eyes and lips work in tandem to allude to this process of coming upon an object with an affective psychosomatic response that deploys both sight and touch in its desire for the presence of that person who is inherently absent. A similar pairing of sight and taste occurred in the celebration of the divine liturgy in which Byzantine worshipers were first shown the Eucharist and then invited to eat and drink. But to understand how the metonymic materialities of Byzantine chalices functioned in this context, it's necessary to consider when and how they were visibly, visually accessible to worshipers as the divine liturgy unfolded. In part, the ability to see such chalices depended on the identity and the role of the Byzantine worshiper. The clergy, the bishop, the priests, and the deacons 
who presided over the celebration of the Eucharist at the church altar inevitably saw chalices and other liturgical objects more often for longer periods and from a much closer physical distance uh, than the lay people. The architectural space in which the Eucharist was celebrated also impacted the visibility of vessels and other liturgical objects. Within a large church or cathedral like Hagia Sophia, which you can see on the left, those closer to the altar were afforded much better views than those further away. Um, from the gallery where this view is, uh, you probably couldn't see a whole lot. But smaller churches, uh, like the 12th century church of St. Pontelaimon in Gorno Nerezi in what is today North Macedonia, must have afforded much better views uh, of the vessels on the altar to really to most of the people gathered together in a small church like this. In addition to the size of the church, barriers separating the altar area from the rest of the church, like the one seen in the image on the right, um, could also obscure the view uh, of the altar for the lay people. But evidence also suggests that in private chapels, there often was no barrier. So a pretty wide variety. The visibility of chalices depended both then on who you were, what your role was, as well as where you went to church. But in addition to the identity of the worshipers and the architectural space in which the Eucharist was celebrated, uh, it was the divine liturgy, the ritual itself, that played a central role in mediating visual access to the sacred vessels. And um, since I don't assume that you all have an intimate knowledge of the um, divine liturgy, and since my students tell me to include more text, I have this little outline that I will return to at a few different points. So beginning with the prothesis, which actually comes before the divine liturgy, um, the clergy who performed the prothesis right uh, before the divine liturgy proper were the first to see the sacred vessels. In most cases, this was probably just uh, one or two members of the clergy performing this right, and lay people were probably not at all present. In Constantinople, um, churches like Hagia Sophia, the prothesis was historically performed in a small exterior building where the vessels were stored outside the main church, uh, known as the Skeva Falakian. But by the 11th century, the Skeva Falakian had fallen out of use, use, and the prothesis was typically performed in a small chamber or niche, uh, often located to the north of the altar. And at Nerezi, you can see the entrance to the prothesis chamber here on the left, a little tiny little space. During the prothesis, the clergy selected the bread and wine that would be offered in the celebration of the Eucharist and placed them into the sacred vessels. The bread went on the discos or in the discos, which was a plate or bowl-like object, and the wine went into the chalice. Uh, and with a little help from Photoshop's new generative AI tool, uh, we can visualize how dramatically this act must have transformed chalices with glass bowls. Wow. In this moment, vessels displaying inscriptions with the words of institution anticipated and perhaps in some sense even began the wine's consecration as the blood of Christ. And I just want you to look how prominently that word blood is displayed right smack in the middle or close to the middle of this chalice. Toward the end of the prothesis, the clergy placed veils over the bread and wine. First, they covered the individual vessels with small veils, the disco kalima or discos veil, and the potiro kalima, the chalice veil. And few of these uh, sorts of textiles survive from the Middle Byzantine period, but um, we do have this one set of richly embroidered discos and chalice veils preserved at the Cathedral Treasury in Halberstadt, Germany, um, which were, are known to have been brought back as booty uh, from the Fourth Crusade by Bishop Konrad von Krosik. Made of silk, silver thread, and pearls, the veils have been dated to the second half of the 12th century. They feature long poetic donor inscriptions that are only partly preserved, but we can see that they refer to the unworthiness of the donor to look upon the body and blood of Christ, the act of, un of veiling, and the desire to see God and touch the Eucharistic bread and wine. So the discos veil um, says, if no Israelite might, might look directly upon the countenance of Moses when he came down from the mountain of divine contemplation, how shall I look upon the body unveiled? how to gaze at it. This with fear, I offer a covering to it 
to the body that is superior to all heavenly hosts. I, Sebastos, Alexios, Peleologos, your pious servant, and you, Logos, word, Christ, uh, grant that I may look upon your countenance on the day of judgment. So this is all about seeing, right? Veiling, veiling and revealing and seeing. And the uh, chalice veil, similar, similarly, and uh, I, I think I better not read it all for the sake of time, um, but you can see um, he refers to the desire to reverently touch your mysteries, the bread of wine. These inscriptions suggest that Byzantine worshipers or at least elite donors like Alexios Paleologos who commissioned these veils contemplated the significance of the veiled vessels and considered looking upon the Eucharistic bread and wine as something akin to looking upon God. Once again, with the aid of Photoshop, if you'll indulge me, uh, we can recreate a hypothetical reconstruction of the chalice of the patriarchs in the treasury of San Marco covered by the veil of Alexios Paleologos at Haberstadt to help us visualize how such objects might have appeared at the end of the Prothesis right. And I feel it's important to like give a little bit of a disclaimer. This is a digital reconstruction. There's no evidence that these objects were ever in physical contact with each other. I didn't actually put this, uh, the veil on top here, but it's, it's just kind of creative aid uh, to our imagination to, to uh, thinking about how these sorts of objects would have appeared to their historical users. After veiling the individual vessels with the smaller veils, the clergy then covered both vessels with a larger veil known as the Air or simply Kalima. And at this point, both vessels are covered and hidden from view from the lay people and the clergy. So after the Prothesis Rite, the divine liturgy itself began. In the dramatic first entrance, The clergy processed through the church, sometimes uh, beginning with a procession outside preceding that, uh, through the church with the gospel book, often accompanied by a processional cross, a censer that released fragrant smoke into the air, and lots of candles. The clergy placed the gospel book on the altar. Psalmody and prayers were chanted. Uh, the deacon or priest then retrieved the gospel book from the altar, brought it out into the church, and read whatever the appointed gospel passage was for the day so that everyone could hear it. During this first part of the liturgy, the sacred vessels remained out of sight. Only after the gospel reading was complete did the clergy go and retrieve the discos and chalice from the place where the prothesis had been performed. Now the clergy carried the sacred vessels soberly to the altar. Byzantine liturgical commentaries visualize this solemn procession as Christ's funeral procession. It was during the great entrance that most of the worshipers in the church caught their first glimpse of these sacred vessels. The larger veil would have been re removed at this point um, and carried separately, but the two smaller veils likely remained in place covering the bread and wine. So as the clergy slowly moved through the church, worshipers were given only a partial view of the sacred vessels. Uh, and we can sort of see what this might've looked like with this painting of the heavenly liturgy, which shows angels vested as deacons carrying the uh, sacred vessels in procession. Let's focus in on those two angels in the middle. We can see that on the left, one angel uh, carefully holds a veiled golden chalice out in front with two hands, while the uh, other angel holds a veiled silver discos aloft uh, atop the head. The veils themselves appear to be richly embroidered and perhaps adorned with pearls, much like the veil preserved, the veils preserved at Haberstadt. And we can return to our reconstruction um, to the image of the image of the chalice of the patriarchs to see what an object like this might have looked like in the great entrance. Um, it's, I think, useful to, to note, based on a reconstruction like this, that the images adorning these veils really wouldn't have been legible to, to uh, worshippers as these vessels were carried through the church. But certainly people would have noticed, their eyes would have been drawn to the rich materials that were used. Uh, and I think it would have been hard not to uh, have your mind kind of wander and to think about the, the bread and wine contained within, right? There's, there's something sort of tantalizing about about hiding that makes you think about what is hidden, right? 
After the clergy completed the procession, they placed the discos and chalice on the altar. They may have removed the two smaller veils and once again placed the larger veil over both vessels, but as the anaphora began, uh, the portion, uh, this is the portion of the liturgy where the bread and wine are finally offered to God and consecrated. Um, the clergy removed all the veils from the vessels and the deacons waved liturgical fans over the bread and wine. So at this point, um, as we can see in the 11th, this 11th century painting of St. Basil the Great of Caesarea celebrating the divine liturgy, at this point, the vessels would have been visible on the altar, at least to the clergy gathered around, if not to some of the lay worshipers who could sneak a peek, uh, perhaps through the temple on the barrier. The celebrant pronounced the words originally spoken by Christ at the Last Supper, which appeared uh, as inscriptions, as we've seen on many of these vessels, take, eat, this is my body, drink of this, all of you, this is my blood, and so on. Uh, at this point, some sources describe the deacon gesturing toward the vessels on the altar. Another visual connection between the words that were being spoken, the words of Christ repeated by the celebrant, and the objects and their inscriptions. In this moment, vessels with red stone and glass responded visually to these words spoken by Christ, um, repeated by the priest, and revealed the body and blood to those who could see them. Finally, uh, regardless of the extent to which lay people were able to catch glimpses of the vessels up until this point, the Eucharist was finally revealed to all when the clergy elevated the consecrated bread and when the Eucharist was brought out from the altar so that the lay people could receive communion. Sources from as early as the sixth century explain that the purpose of the elevation was to show the consecrated bread to the worshipers. Byzantine sources, uh, you may be surprised, uh, are actually not very clear about when exactly the bread and wine uh, become the body and blood of Christ. And this becomes actually a point of contention uh, and conversation uh, with Western Christians. But some sources suggest that it was in the elevation when the bread was, was raised up so that everyone could see it that this was the definitive moment of consecration when the bread became the body of Christ. So I think uh, it might be argued, uh, or I should say, it might also be argued uh, based on the various prayers of the clergy um, that the consecration of the bread and wine was in fact a more gradual process that began in the prothesis and gradually unfolded through the many words and actions of the divine liturgy and finally culminated with the revealing and offering of the bread and wine to the people for communion. So in light of this, I think we might understand the clergy's acts of veiling, unveiling, and finally revealing the bread and wine uh, as the body and blood of Christ as paralleling, and even in some sense participating in this gradual process of consecration. When the Eucharist was finally brought out from the altar into the midst of the worshipers, the material of materiality of the stone and glass vessels facilitated this act of revealing the Eucharist so that worshipers could fully behold the body and blood of Christ as they approached for communion. And since it is likely that many worshipers, in fact, would not have approached for communion, at least not at every divine liturgy, um, this metonymic function of chalices, their ability to show, to reveal their contents, um, enable those who are not going to commune to, in some sense, be able to see and engage with um, the body and blood of Christ. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to um, skip ahead a little bit here. When worshipers finally received communion from the chalice, they did so as approaching uh, and receiving from the very body of Christ himself. Another liturgical commentary, the Protheoria from the 11th century uh, by Nicholas and Theodora Vendita um, describes the addition of hot water to the chalice shortly before communion so that the Eucharistic wine became warm uh, as if blood from a living body, which is what uh, Byzantines believed the Eucharistic body and blood to be. Uh, it says, a small kettle of hot water is brought and they mix some of it with the cups or chalices placed on the holy altar in order that the hot water poured in at the time of communion complete the perfect type. Just as the blood and water came forth from the living divine side of, at the crucifixion, uh, both filled with warmth, with those communicating from the nipple of the chalice as if touching the very life-giving side of Christ. So again, we see the vessel sort of collapsed uh, into the body of Christ in, with this language. 
Like the cut metonym in the New Testament, such Middle Byzantine descriptions of communion blurred the distinction between the Eucharistic container and the divine blood it contained. Stone and glass chalices visually paralleled these descriptions of communion, visually dematerializing and probably physically warming with the addition of the hot water so that worshipers could see the blood of Christ as they approached the warm cup to drink as from the body of Christ himself. And for those who could read the inscriptions with the words of institution, the chalice spoke from, the chalice spoke with the words of Christ, this is my blood, spoke in the first person, reinforcing the conflation of the vessel and its contents. Uh, although stone and glass Eucharistic vessels were used both in the early Byzantine period and the late Byzantine period, so before and after the period that I'm discussing here today, um, the vast majority of stone and glass vessels, vessels that survive are from the Middle Byzantine period. And it seems uh, likely that part of the reason for this is that these vessels were used um, to address uh, Eucharistic controversies that were happening at this time. Stefan Albrecht has argued that the sudden widespread appearance of the words of institution on numerous Eucharistic vessels right around the 10th century was a direct response to the emergence of the Bogomils in Bulgaria at the same time. The Bogomils held dualist views and denied that the Eucharistic bread and wine were really the body and blood of Christ. And this prompted uh, condemnation from uh, the patriarch in Constantinople at the time, who said, against those who do not believe uh, in what is really the body and blood of Christ, which he gave to his apostles saying, take, eat, and entrusted to them anathema. So by combining stone and glass bowls with the words of institution, Middle Byzantine chalices offered a multimodal articulation of the Orthodox understanding of the Eucharist for anyone who could see them. And for literate worshipers approaching the chalice, there was no ambiguity. The vessel's contents and its significance were plain for all to see. All right, let me conclude now. Now that we've sketched the ritual and theological backdrops against which chalices like this would have been encountered, I wanna conclude by considering how Byzantine worshipers might have experienced an object like this and others like it. Um, but first it's worth noting one additional element hidden within this sardonyx vessel, a round enamel icon of Christ situated right at the bottom of the stone bowl. So as the clergy prepared for the divine liturgy by filling the chalice of the patriarchs with wine during the prothesis rite, the vessel's performative materiality and inscription, as well as the enamel icon of Christ now covered with wine, began the process of consecrating the wine as the blood of Christ. In the great entrance, the clergy processed solemnly through the church and brought the chalice to the altar. Most of the worshipers caught their first glimpse of the chalice at this time, but since it remained veil veiled, its red stone bowl and accompanying inscription remained hidden from view. On the altar, the chalice was finally unveiled for the anaphora and the bread and wine were consecrated as the body and blood of Christ. When the celebrant spoke Christ's words from the last supper, this is my blood, uh, the, the metonymic chalice spoke them too. And when the chalice was finally revealed to all, worshipers saw the Eucharist visually manifested through the materiality of the red stone bowl and beheld Christ himself. Those who drew closer to receive communion saw the words of institution inscribed around the chalice's rim. For the educated who were aware of the current Eucharistic controversies, the materiality, text, and iconography of the chalice eloquently proclaimed the Orthodox understanding of the Eucharistic bread and wine as the body and blood of Christ. To partake of the Eucharist, from a vessel like this was to assent to the orthodox theological position. For those permitted to drink directly from the chalice, the sardonyx bowl's trans translucency gave way to the translucency of the wine itself inside the cup, and the worshiper may have been able to catch a glimpse of the enamel icon uh, of the very body of Christ, another visual gloss that affirmed the Eucharist, uh, the Eucharist and, uh, in both bread and wine to be the body and blood of Christ himself. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for a uh, very evocative uh, talk. I think uh, uh, the, the term economy itself uh, just just uh, uh, bring forward all the potential for interpretation and uh, and thinking with uh, with this material and and your talk really just spurs uh, I don't know how many rabbit holes for. Uh, uh, for, for thinking with the material, but before uh, I jump into your article, I wonder whether 
with any questions that others would uh, have like raising. Um, that was great. Um, yes. I was just wondering, you know, looking at the sardonyx and the materiality yes. of the stone, um, it kind of occurs to me, you know, we were talking about community, the communion of both kinds. And I'm wondering if these sort of swirling patterns of different colors would have also been sort of a significant way of visualizing that to the worshiper. And also whether um, you know, these patterns also would be a more in a more uh, sort of pedestrian way suggested sort of the, the the liquid nature of the content. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, it's hard, it's hard not to look at that and think about the liquid, uh, the liquid state of the contents. And I didn't really talk about it for the sake of time, but um, <clears throat> the art historian Fabio Bari has written quite a bit about the ways that um, the Byzantines sort of inherited and continued um, uh, the understandings of vein stones uh, as forming from a liquid state. And so Bari's work has um, talked a lot about the marble on uh, church floors and he identifies language of water that is then applied to interpret these sorts of floors. So absolutely, um, I kind of highlighted the, the blood association with the red stones, but the liquid association was also there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, thank you for the seven. I have that, yeah, two quick questions. Uh, so the veil mm -hmm. is used to cover, um, when you, Starting off a little before showing it, I was imagining it to be kind of thinner in a way, yeah. in texture. So, how much would this remind one of a shroud, right? Especially if it's covering the blood of Christ and the vessel itself being the quotidian, being the mechanism for the blood, kind of also being the body, and that the bread is covered too, right? How much of that would actually be the shroud in which Christ is wrapped before the resurrection and then it's taken off and voila, right? Yeah, uh, it certainly, it, these veils certainly had that association. Um, it, it is, one wishes that there were more of these things that survive. I think these are the, this is the only set from the Middle Byzantine period. So we have one set with one example of iconography. Um, but the iconography of the uh, entombed Christ will actually come to adorn in the late Byzantine period, especially the larger veil that goes over both. Um, and so there's there's some great scholarship on this. Um, this larger veil that went over both was often, often showed the, the crucified Christ who had been laid in the tomb, so horizontal. So the uh, kind of horizontal orientation of the, of the dead body um, aligning with the kind of larger shape of the veil. And then this was carried in procession. Um, and of course, um, this becomes the epitaphios that is used in Orthodox Holy Week, uh, carried as a kind of icon of the, the dead Christ that's entombed after uh, Great and Holy Friday. So yeah, absolutely that symbolism is there and only becomes stronger, I think. And we wish we had more evidence from this period to know wh when, when it starts happening, yeah. <laughs> so if you go back to the chalice with uh, the stamp of approval, the devil icon inside, right? Oh yeah. How common were they? Because this reminded me of kind of when you go in Brahman in Vancouver, right? As you're finishing the bowl, if there's no little circle saying thank you at the end, you know it's not legit Brahman, even if you're quite <laughs> tasty. So uh, this has a point. So how often would believers expect to see at least a glimpse of the enamel kind of I can stand in the bottom or, or not, right? Because that that would be the proper seal of approval that this blood in that this wine is the proper seal blood of Christ you're taking or not. That's yeah, right. it's a great question. It it never becomes that widespread. There are two surviving examples, both in Venice. Um, so it never becomes standard. Uh, much more standard at this time are the words of institution around the outside. Much, much more common is uh, among the surviving examples, at least in San Marco, is this um, materiality. We have what were certainly cheaper vessels that nobody ever really talks about because they're not very pretty uh, that are made from bronze often, copper and bronze. And so these don't have that materiality that's signifying or kind of um, performing um, the contents, but they do still often have the inscription around the rim. So really seems to be important that the inscription is kind of addressing perhaps this theological controversy. Um, 
But also, I mean, we have these two examples, uh, which may be outliers, but we might also think about ancient Greek vessels, drinking vessels, which often have right iconography imagery inside, and you finish your drink, and there's some joke or whatever, right? So. Yeah. There's a really funny one in the Cyclotic Museum that's like a guy hung over. He's like got a wine cup and he's like leaning on a column. Yeah. <laughs> and it's right at the bottom of the glass. I, you know, with, especially with the transition from communion under two species to communion by intinction, you know, most people are not looking at the inside. In fact, um, it's hard to say at this point whether this one, this one could have been used either way or both ways, but the clergy are going to become the primary uh, audience for what's in the cup uh, after that new practice emerges. Yeah, so the symbol of the is the, there's like a couple different veils. So one is the Beth Said that Rebecca wears in the Old Testament. The other is the Masfit, right? Which is- um, You're like, talking about that, the veils that are laid over? Yeah. 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 So like what's happening is, is that the symbol is being woven into the Old and New Testament, mm -hmm. not being like reflected in the Middle Ages. So the veils exist in both. I mean, the essential symbolism is that of like Christ being also like the temple, and of course mm -hmm. the temple veil being rent, of course the <clears throat> Of the bells removed, that's the most basic symbolism. But what they're doing in this is they're also leading back to the the veil Rebecca war, which is the Beth Saya, and then they're also leading back to the Mastid veil, right? Um, and then the um Misak veil, right, in the in the temple. And so that's like in the Hebrew. So like that's what they're doing is they're making an allusion to both of those things, right? So in, in literature in the liturgical way, the wine in like the cup is like a symptomata of like the irrational soul, whereas the bread is the rational soul. Because it's like there's four elements to make the bread. Then the leaven element is basically the rational soul of Christ is added and always present as carried forward in the preparation. And of course it's a replication of like the um, the reconstitution of a priesthood under Melchizedek. That's why the priests are doing it separately. Yeah. But that'd be yeah that'd be my interpretation the the veil situation. Yeah there's there's it's it's interesting to look at the liturgical sources. There are often multiple kind of layers of symbolism that get applied, and they are not often consistent. Um, so it's an interesting thing, especially in liturgical commentaries. There's there doesn't seem to be a, a need felt to kind of define things with a one to one interpretation. The genre of liturgical commentaries kind of continues to be written uh, through the end of the Byzantine period. And it, it's this sort of creative literary tradition where commentators keep sort of elaborating and say, you know, this thing symbolizes this, but also this, but also this. Um, so so it, I think it, in some ways it defies our expectations. We want to find one kind of symbolic meaning, um, but this wasn't the case. I think it was a much more creative sort of activity um, for Byzantine uh, commentators who were usually clergy. Um, they love to kind of layer these, yeah, layer these different readings. I think some of the various like oriental churches that split off are kind of like time capsules. Mm. So their interpretations kind of phase off into the role and like preserve some of the stuff that you can kind of like infer meaning from. Mm. I think that's, that's part. But but what I was saying is basically based on <clears throat> Old Testament Hebrew um, references in these layer depictions, but also like yeah. like a I'm, I'm using like a prophet and Yeah, we the the the. The material evidence long predates any kind of liturgical yeah. or interpretive. I mean, we have from the sixth century um, what's called a star that would go over the discos. And that's how we know that veils were being put on, because the star was basically there to prevent the veil from messing up the bread, right? So we have this early star long centuries before we have anything like kind of prayers to accompany uh, the putting on of the veil. So in these early centuries, we don't know for a long we have, time. We have some description in early, uh, like we have like Victor's morning, it's just like an inscription of some of that stuff, or interpretations rather mm. than just like, that, that dates back to that. But yeah, generally, generally. Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering if we had any information about the artisans who were making these chalices and if they would have had any sort of connection to that. Mm. Like, Metonym process, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, we really, I don't think we do know much about the artisans. Um, some of these, not not the ones I showed today, but a few of these chalices reused antique uh, stone vessels, which were which were not designed as Christian chalices. 
uh, and they are carved much better than what the Middle Byzantine craftsmen are able to do. Um, others were are thought to have been carved uh, around this time. Um, no, we don't we, we don't know much about the craftsmen at all. We know we we know that these um, sorts of stone vessels were uh, luxury objects, you know, highly sought after, not widespread, um, expensive to to produce. So we know that. Uh, and one of the chapters in the volume um, discusses some of these materials, both in uh, objects like this and in um, church architecture in terms of the kind of labor and uh, uh, work that went, in, went into their production as a way of producing value and meaning. Yeah. Two things in my Sure. Uh, I really appreciated your uh, uh, inclusion of the procession and mm -hmm. the book okay. in the church, and then we will do yeah. uh, the rest with, um, uh, with the cup. Uh, if only because that in of itself is such an interesting invocation of the different kind of uh, states of the Trinity, mm -hmm. and that the book as word can yeah. be eternal, uh, and uh, the cup. Yeah. Uh, as uh, Christ, uh, uh, whatever is in there, as Christ, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the temporal, uh, and both of them coexisting in the church at the same time, the same way that they should coexist in the Trinity. So yeah. that's kind, kind of an interesting thing that, again, I don't think it's ever uh, implied, but would have existed in this kind of mind, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think there would have also been all sorts of resonances with the iconography. So you talk about the book. Excuse me, and of course, in middle, middle Byzantine churches, we can think of Daphne just outside of Athens. You have the monumental Pantocrator in the dome with the book, right? And it's under this image of of Christ as Almighty, you know, ruling from the heavens with a book that the book would pass, and then the book would come back out and be read. Uh, and then in the um, sanctuaries, the bima of these Middle Byzantine churches, the iconography really proliferates in the Middle Byzantine period. Um, and this kind of goes, I think, to the one of the previous questions or comments. Um, we see, again, not an attempt to come up with one image to accompany what's going on in the altar, but multiple images. So you often see the Virgin and Child, you see the communion of the apostles, you see um, bishops as concelebrants joining in the liturgical celebration, bishop saints, um, sometimes offering the Christ child as a sacrifice on the altar in the app. So oftentimes Christ will appear uh, two, three, four times in the altar area alone. And then more, if you think about the Pantocrator in the dome, uh, all these different kind of moments um, as an infant uh, sharing this supper with his apostles and then as, you know, ruling from the heavens as God. So yeah, I think these things are all um, bouncing around. And I think uh, in people's minds, in the visual culture of this space, uh, in the liturgical commentaries, I think the liturg liturgical commentaries are so telling that um, when these church authorities are writing about the liturgy, they don't say, you have to understand this point in this way. It's not like that. It's, it's this very creative, you know, you can think about this from the Old Testament, you can think about this from the New Testament, you can think about this kind of apocalyptic image. And, and so there's really this not just a freedom, but you're encouraged, I think, to make all these many associations. It's a really rich sort of, I think, cultural framework for experiencing ritual in this way, you know? And I'm thinking of uh, the virus interpretation. So I think Roland also has something mm -hmm. that's done in his, uh, in his work of uh, uh, the blood spewing of uh, Christ yeah. uh, uh, and the finger touching it. Uh, Having all yeah. this uh, sexual, sexualized, penetrative kind of uh, uh, nature, uh, and, and such such analysis was just for Western kind of yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, medieval imagery, uh, and it's fascinating that you might have a veil with uh, explicit reference to the harlot who brings yeah. the, sen the sensuality in, yeah. uh, in Christ through the sheer interaction with him, uh, engaging with uh, an object where exactly these other types of iconography may have pointed towards an almost eroticized connection yeah. to uh, the connection to the blood of Christ. Yeah, well, even the prothearia saying, imagine you're drinking from the nipple even of Christ. Yeah. It, the chalice is not getting in the way. It's really 
bringing you close to the body in a, in a very embodied and sensual way. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, is uh, uh, the cup ever seen as a sacred vessel? The heon as a womb, and does the cup ever become imagined not as wound uh, and uh, mm. uh, blood of Christ being sacrificed, but as uh, the space of birth uh, for, for Christ? Yes, I think so. I think. Um... Uh, who is it? Uh, Maria Evangelatu has written a bit about this, about not just the chalice, but the church and the altar area with that monumental image of the Virgin, sometimes with a child, sometimes without in the apse. So visually, as you're approaching the chalice, you're seeing this, you're seeing the body of the Virgin there. Um, and uh, if the Christ child is there, it's certainly evoking the incarnation. And then it's interesting in these churches where you have both the Virgin and child, and then the child again below being sacrificed, uh, the Molismos motif, I think you're very much meant to connect the the incarnation and birth. And then we see this in literature, kind of miracle stories and hagiographies, right? Where people um, imagine that they sort of see miraculously the bread and wine, usually because they're doubting, right? They see it revealed for what it is. And it's always visualized as the infant, uh, the, the infant's body, not the body of a man, even though sort of theologically, you often, you know, in liturgical sources, it's the crucified and risen Christ whose body is in there. But in these, in these um, sort of hagiographical accounts, it's the Christ child who is, who is imagined. And, and you also often have the Annunciation split on the two sides of the altar area. So you're sort of encountering um, the Eucharist between the angel and the Virgin. And the implication is that the spirit is coming down and the incarnation starts happening in the space between. That said, um, and, and I should say also just quickly that in the prothesis, the prothesis is full of passion imagery, crucifixion and sacrifice, but as a sort of a secondary layer and it increases in the late Byzantine period, there's all this incarnation imagery of the nativity. And it's in the middle Byzantine period too. But that being said, um, we don't really see that in the iconography that decorates these chalices. We don't, I don't think we see, uh, we usually see Christ Pontocrater, um, Christ as a man. Yeah, that's not the baby Christ. Yes, the yes, yes, yes. So again, uh, I, I would say the chalices are not necessarily taking us in that direction, but that doesn't mean it's not one of the things that go, is going on in people's head, both because of the monumental iconography in the space and because of these miracle accounts about the infant Christ being, being sacrificed. So I think that is certainly part of, and one of the ways that people could sort of visualize and understand this, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, you lots of questions that are still formulating in my mind. Um, one observation, uh, embarrassing one, I don't know how many cases of chalices <laughs> I've walked past in museums and, and how did, how did how I looked at, I paid attention. Uh, and uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little humble about what I'm missing. At the same time, this is where my question, uh, where my question comes from. I don't know how I would have been able to appreciate uh, what you've been talking about. Just so fascinating to learn this language, right? And, and to understand, especially the historical moments yeah. uh, and your, your explanation of what was happening in the Roman world just made me think about um, in the Western Europe in response to the Catholics. Mm, yeah. And uh, you know, to think about there. But I'm just I'm I'm sitting here listening and I'm, I'm looking at this um this incredible image and just the, the intricacy. There's so much involved, as you said, there's so many um different different elements, uh different materials that go into this. So how 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 can we go uh, even deeper into enamel or the, the jewels as a way to possibly understand how some of these messages uh, uh, would have uh, would have resonated with with uh, with people. How do you learn that that language? Uh, but I'm I'm curious to know whether you know I'm noticing are they pearls? Yeah, they're pearls, uh, yeah. So not so so common. Is there yeah. something something in, in in them that 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 adds to what you've been talking about in terms of the stone and, and, and other objects? Yeah, well thank you, Emily. Um I, I think the reason we walk by chalice cases is the fault of art historians. As I, it's a fault of the discipline, which has historically said these are minor arts because they're functional. They're not 
you know, history paintings that we put on the wall and are worth spending time with. Um, but you're right. I mean, this is some very dense, densely sort of um, delivered material, both visually and within, I think, this broader cultural framework. And I think, you know, it's a product of this centuries of accumulation of these rituals and their interpretation, um, which it can be hard for us to jump into from the outside because because there's so so much sort of a cruise. Um, of course, a lot could be said. Um, I, I have a colleague, Sharon Steiner, who's uh, who recently finished her dissertation around the same time I did on enamels um, as a as a technology, um, and so I think she has a book coming out soon on that. Um, it's there. We we could speculate on uh, liturgical meanings for these, and I think. Byzantine commentators would want us to. That's what these liturgical commentaries do. They really encourage you. And so, um, you know, it's it, it's interesting that that um, in some liturgical sources, the the Eucharist is referred to as a pearl, and um, in in some manuscripts they say that when the clergy are communing, they should use the cloth so that a pearl doesn't fall. You know, to, to be carefully. And so the word pearl is used. And so I've often thought, oh. Look at this, the, the red stone is the wine, the blood, and then these pearls are the body, especially after this uh, practice of intinction, of putting the bread, these particles into the, the cup. Um, at the same time, um, I, I have to be careful because uh, Byzant these also look a lot like Byzantine crowns, which are studded with pearls. Uh, and so I think, uh, while the Byzantines wouldn't object to us reading something like that into the pearls, they probably love it. Um, I think this has just as much to do with the these objects, the, the kind of um, context in which they were commissioned and produced as imperial objects, and these associations with of pearls with um, with the imperial court, with the emperor and the court. So I have to be careful as someone who focuses on the divine liturgy often, not to always read through that lens. Um, but there is certainly a lot there in, in the Byzantine sources. The enamels, um, again, I think have a lot to do with these objects being luxury objects. That said, uh, in the iconoclastic controversy uh, of the eighth and ninth century, there are all kinds of places where the Byzantines talk about color as being an attribute of matter and of the created world. And so, I think we could perhaps extend this reading of the materiality of the red stone um, and talk about the enamels as well um, as really seeking to evoke uh, the incarnation in some sense. Um, the more humble bronze chalices also sometimes include iconography just kind of um, uh, incised into the metal, which wouldn't have been um, as evocative. But in that case, they're clearly not deciding they don't want to include color. It's a matter of cost and that these are not imperial donors. So yeah, there, there is so much here. And I think that that's what's exciting about uh, what people are, sort for, for, for people like me, for our historians um, with this kind of material term, what people are calling so-called is that um, art historians, not that art historians had not been paying attention to materials before, but I think there's a new excitement about thinking about materials um, alongside images and, and objects. Yeah. Thank you very much for the great You talked about uh, the Bulgarian challenge and yeah. how as a result they were forced to reinforce the dispersive power of the material they used. To yeah. the Are there any other similar uh, turning points? Uh, in terms of evolution of these materials? Yeah. Yeah. You mean like controversies or you yeah. mean in the broader history? In the broader history. Um, that affected the source of power. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, there were several things that might have, um, there were several kind of controversies that were causing people to think about the Eucharist. Um, the iconoclasts say things about the Eucharist that the iconophiles get angry about. Um, there's the Bulgar mills. There are other controversies in the 12th century. So people are thinking about the Eucharist and asking questions. 
Um, I think I think this is a this is a good really good question. Um, it's a hard question because it because of course these materials have a very long history, um, going back um, before Constantinople is Constantinople to, you know into the ancient world, and so the, there are ancient writers who talk about bloodstone, for example, Pliny talks about in the natural history about um, I think bloodstone being used to heal blood diseases and things like that. Um, so these these things have a long history, and of course the Byzantines are the Romans. So <laughs> uh, it's not like there's some break. Um, yeah, so I think um, without I, I could drone on about this probably for too long. So I don't know that there I, I don't know that there are part particular things that I would pull out at this moment, other than to say that there's a lot. There's a lot in the ancient world through the early Byzantine period with Justinian's construction of Hagia Sophia, uh, which doesn't really have images at first. It's all about materials. It's all about the marble taken from all over the empire, right? All these different marbles. And that's what that's what all the ekphrastic texts talk about. They talk about the materials, right? Uh, taken from all over the empire. This is significant. And um, uh, and this is as much about the emperor and imperial might as it is about anything church related, right? Um, and, and interestingly, we even see a few stone vessels in the late Byzantine period. Um, so, I think the interest in these objects doesn't stop. And there are these different kind of um, inflection points. It's a, it's a bigger question than I can answer now though, but it's a very good one. Um, Fabio Bari, who I already mentioned, has he wrote a great article about the, the floors as water, but he also had a book that came out a couple of years ago, which is a, all about stone in the late antique and Byzantine and medieval world, all about the kind of these different stones and how they meant and, and how they performed. So that might, that's yeah, something to look at perhaps, yeah. One thing that they might lose uh, in the end of my videos and it, it takes us to this multivalent kind of space that mm -hmm. you were presenting to us. Uh, and, and, I, and I wonder, I'm simply ignorant, it's not at all my idea at point. Um, is there uh, work uh, in thinking about uh, the attempts to evoke uh, multiple interpretations, about uh, uh, the openness to these multiple interpretations, and about the degree to which the church, as a result of this openness, becomes a space of debate and discourse rather than set dogma? Oh. Is there any of that? I don't know. Um... Uh, it's something that I have kind of keyed in on through reading these commentaries many times over the last several years. Uh, and I think initially I thought I could find early on in my doctoral research, kind of find what does this mean? What does the chalice stand for? And I, and I was maybe frustrated, but then became excited by this um, additive sort of approach to the interpretation. Um, often in liturgical scholarship, I mean, lit liturgical texts are also not standardized until the modern period, right? The invention of the printing press, essentially. Um, there's all kinds of liturgical variation. So um, in a sense, it goes hand in hand with that, I, I suppose. Um, uh, and, and I lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, I was, I was going to say, uh, in ritual studies, people talk about this. Yeah, people talk more broadly in ritual studies, ritual theory about multimodality uh, and sort of media theory, I think as well. But in ritual studies, um, Stanley Tambaya has talked about, uh, has a great uh, piece about performativity and ritual and has talked about multimodality, about this layering of modes in ritual, how this is a common characteristic of ritual across cultures. So, uh, so not uh, not a uniquely Byzantine thing um, as such. Um, I, I have found it very very fascinating that the liturgical commentaries, in particular, written by church officials, um, for probably a general audience to some extent, but probably I think it's often been theorized largely at a clerical audience. So, clergy writing to clergy about how this should be understood. It is fascinating to me that they are so open ended with these interpretations. But I think it it follows, and so another way to think about this. It follows um, biblical exegesis, um, the way that church fathers um, engage with uh, the Hebrew Bible and are feel no pressure to come up with one reading, right? Uh, someone like Origen, right? You know, can say there's this level that we can read the text as kind of a moral lesson. We can read it as history. We can read it as, you know, all these things. So 
so it undoubtedly it comes out in these in the liturgical commentaries it undoubtedly comes out of this exegetical biblical um, interpretive tradition um, in which biblical texts have multiple meanings yeah Yeah, just a quick one. These are mostly from Constantinople, right? Um, we think. Probably, yes. Just quickly, we know they were carried around the provinces, especially from Emperor Alexios, right? From the kind of the Greek province and everything, so it wasn't all the bishops coming from Constantinople. Would they bring objects of value with them? Because I'm thinking they were not texting, they were writing to each other. Right? Yeah. But could you send me a book in a book of code that I yes. read? Um, I don't know if I've mentioned Charles, but you write this thing about wanting his sigmoid ring changed and then he sends it to Thessaloniki, they change it, it's not the way he wants it, so he writes it, he sends it back right how he wants it. So, yeah, I'm saying, do we see any examples of this? Would Charles is wrong? Any other portable church goods that they might bring with from Constantinople, representing that this is the center of power from which I come from, legitimacy? Yeah, they yes, do they do. And I'm and I wish I had a specific reference for you, Alex. I could look, I I know there are texts that that do discuss these things. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the the Byzantine diplomacy with the uh, Muslim world. They're they're sending objects, not necessarily sacred objects, but luxury objects. And um, you could certainly understand those in these light uh, in in this as part of this kind of same world. Um, the, there was a gold discos um, in Sofia, I think. Um, that um, Stefan Albrecht talks about because it has the words of institution. And I can't remember if we have any textual references to this. I don't think we do, but I think Albrecht argues that this was sent as part of this right. sort of right. theological yeah. Yeah, yeah. response. Yeah. Yeah, it's so hard to know. And that's one of the right. challenging things about um, dealing with these portable objects is like they're all displaced. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are maybe a couple objects on Mount Athos that we think maybe are, have sort of been there for their whole lives basically since they were get, gifted but um almost all, all of the portable objects in the middle of byzantine period are displaced many of them by the fourth crusade um yeah so it's hard to say it is interesting that these lesser quality objects though or less luxurious many of them also have the words of institution so it it, it um it, it seems that there was an attempt if this was part of this theological response to a eucharistic controversy that this was then deployed across media and with both luxury and sort of more mass produced, if we could say, cheaper objects. So. For, on the words of institution, do you think that's uh, more of a response to the um, Syriac rate um, non-requirement to use the words of institution in the proper way? I'm sort of relying on, on Stefan Albrecht who thinks it's a response to the Bogomil controversy yeah, in the 10th second. Because it's, it's like right at that moment, the yeah. timing seems seems really to fit. Um, again, you know, the iconoclasts, there are others, um, there are other controversies, but the timing seems to line up for that. Yeah. Well, I just the conversation. Thank you. Okay, with that then in mind, uh, I wanna thank our, uh, Speaker and uh, uh, audience, both uh, present here and uh, online. Uh, and uh, before uh, we leave today, uh, thank you in general for uh, uh, joining us for the uh, spring uh, seminar series and being here uh, for our uh, presentations. And uh, we're already in the process of uh, uh, crafting next year's uh, uh, series, and we uh, will be uh, seeing you at, uh, at events uh, as of September. Uh, again, thank you so much for uh, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And for a very nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you.